After three or so months in London, at the beginning of May in 1975, David says he became very ill. And eventually I fell into the, you know, the front hall of one of the people that I would have been associated with and just said, you know, I'm dying, you're going to have to let me go. And I think he really panicked then because he was afraid I might die in the company of one of his clients. So he gave me, I know, 50 pounds and said, go home. David didn't return, but last summer, after reading a newspaper article about historical child sex abuse, he then went to the police. What did they ask you? What are they doing about your particular story? The interviews were quite brutal. Um, just and just trying to get the information out of me and they test the information and so on. Did they drive around London with you so you could identify the places? Yes, after the two days of the interviews they drove me around the various locations in London where I was trying to identify some of the locations. I have given them hours and hours of videotaped evidence, got into the most explicit detail. They then spent a long time questioning me about this and I understand that they spent maybe nine or ten weeks after that actually following up every lead. Now, the problem is a lot of the, the sort of the people involved are now dead. There's a few of them still alive, but I would say most of them are dead. Part of the problem with many of these types of cases is that the majority of allegations are made against people who are dead. The police attempt to investigate them, but there is a lack of hard evidence, with none of the DNA, mobile phone records or credit card transactions of current investigations. And although the police may lend a sympathetic ear to victims, in the end, there is no conclusion to the case. It is simply left in the air. David is still looking for evidence to back up his story. He's shown me a business card from the bookshop where he worked, a book called The Romance of a Bookshop, he says was given to him by one of the influential men he met, which was signed and dated April 1975, and shocking, explicit photos of him taken at the time, which he found online. After he'd spoken to the police, he was searching in his loft and stumbled across a box of diaries, including a section of one from 1975, in which he had written down notes about restaurants, events, people he met, some prominent individuals and some I'd never heard of, and even the weather. On my first visit, I saw it. He gave me a photocopy of the diary. My editor and I went about corroborating as many of the details in it as we could, and we both questioned him at length about it. There are a few names mentioned in the diary that can be found elsewhere, but some of those he writes about have never previously been linked to historical sex abuse. Dave Marshall was in the Met for over 30 years, a detective chief inspector and former head of the paedophile unit, and I knew that he'd dealt with this kind of evidence before. I'm just going to show you this. It's just a copy. Mm. I mean, and you have dealt with a diary in those some of the cases. I mean, you, is it genuine? I suppose the, it's a question that you have to... You, you have to you have to ask that. but the big question is why would someone why would someone do that what's their kind of motivation to 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 write it sort of now and pretend to write it, it was, now and pretend yes. it was written written earlier and then people say well they want compensation they want they want this but i've had very few victims who their focus is compensation well i can very, tell you he he doesn't want compensation yes, he simply wants to put um in his words, um, the record straight. And there was a period of time where people diaries were very popular and people would, would record them. I think you look at it and it'll have a kind of ring of credibility about it, but it's that kind of painstaking of corroborating what you can, looking at the language that's that used. Before my second visit to see David, this time with my editor, I found out that he and his wife had burnt the diary. And that may present problems if it appears in a, in a criminal case, is that the original, which the actual binding of it and, and everything else, has been destroyed, and you've got a photocopy of the original. Well, that's the next best evidence, but people, rightly or wrongly, will question, well, why did you, you destroy it? And if their focus isn't on a criminal investigation, it's just on well, this is just part of my life. This will be symbolic for me and help me by burning this. That, in a way, helps me deal with it. Well, that's their decision. i never seen this document as something that's an important piece of evidence that we presented in a big court case. I saw it as an emotional, passionate document that was written by someone. It had nothing to do with the law. It had nothing to do with compensation or money or a good story. This was a tortured troubled young man who was capturing these events as they happened. 
He also felt that if he burnt the original but kept the high-res photocopies of it, it could never be altered or added to, but the document could be preserved. He's now annotated a copy of the diary and estimates that he had sexual contact with over 25 men during his three-month period in London. He explained to me how hard that was for his wife to come to terms with, and he saw its destruction as a part of the healing process. I, I mean, I felt it was something... It was something unclean they have in the house. It was something, I mean, what was it? It was bad. It was terrible. Um, some of the, the stuff that was recorded. I just didn't want that particular document in the house anymore. It was as if, here's this thing jumping through time. Let's deal with it and it's gone. Let's get on with our life. On that visit, David was very open and spent five hours answering all the difficult questions we threw at him as we poured over the copy of his diary. I watched him at several points unable to speak because he was so upset by what he was reading. Here is the final part of David's interview. It's such a long time ago mm -hmm. and you talk with such clarity yeah. and you remember such details which you'd forgotten for mm -hmm. a long time mm -hmm. and some people might, might wonder how can you remember so clearly when it was what, 40 years yeah. ago? Yeah, um, I mean, it's... it's I think when you go through something so traumatic um, and see some of the things that I've seen, it is seared into your brain. You can't unforget it. I mean, in some ways, I have successfully buried it. After I was interviewed by the Met, I went through many, many weeks of counselling. And it was during that where I was encouraged to talk about it that all of a sudden I found, you know, um, various memories and instances and names recurring as I was actually forced to relive it. And it's about putting it in perspective. One part of me says, you know, what I was through was a, a terrible experience. It involved some senior people. But at the same time, it was only a few weeks, 40 years ago. And I try and say, well, you know, it hasn't defined who I am. I've had a successful career. I have, you know, grown up children. Um, I've had a good life. And that has enabled me to sort of keep this locked away. But I mean, to be perfectly honest, you know, there's times I break down and have moments of emotional collapse, but I don't weep for myself. I weep for the children, the children that I saw. And I wonder what what happened to them? Where did their story go? What became of them? Where are they now? What age are they? What do you think about those people that did that to you now? I would like the person that I was 20 years ago, I would like that young man to be able to meet those people and ask them questions from his perspective rather than mine. Do you wish you'd had more courage or what, what do you say to your 20-year-old self? Well, I mean, it's funny you should mention that because when I actually write about these experiences or talk about them, I sort of project it back onto this young man. It's almost as if I'm not talking about myself. And I suppose what I need to do is try and capture him and break him out of that and bring him forward and release him from that past that was his. Are you beginning to, do you think? I think so, yeah, I think so, step by step. Yeah. But are you still feeling angry with those people? I don't feel anger anymore. Anger is just too strong. It's too heavy a burden to carry through life. Being angry doesn't change anything. It won't change the past. You know, in many ways, I just feel sorry for them. You know, but they had everything. They had money, they had wealth, they had position, they had power. But at the end of the day, they had nothing. If someone looks on the internet, there's quite a lot mm. of information about this. Yeah. Uh, they can piece together a story and there would be people, mm -hmm. some people, who might say, you're making it up, you've just read it right. on the internet, mm -hmm. you know, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Why should we believe you? Sure. Well, I mean, I don't think you can make up the fact that I actually left here in February 1975, got a job where I got the job. So there's all those elements are completely factual. People will always choose to believe what they want to believe. I mean, I'm 60 years old. I hope to retire in a few years' time. Why on earth would I bring this turmoil and torment into my life and into my family? I've gone through hell and back dealing with this and coming to terms with it. So I have no motive for doing it. I have no incentive. Um, I haven't and will not seek compensation for what happened. Uh, you know, what happened, happened. I went to see the chief executive of the NSPCC, Peter Wanless, who spent many hours sifting through paperwork at the Home Office, investigating if there had been a cover-up of child sex abuse. He didn't find that evidence. One of the reflections I have on the, the many um, files that I um, waded through um, in and around the Home Office was this sort of pervasive sense of 
difference in priorities um, at that time. So in the 70s, if there was a suggestion that someone might have committed a crime against a child, the first thought is, well, what impact would that have on um, uh, the reputation of the organisation? Question one. Is there a kind of national security implication to this? Question two. And today, I would like to think, if someone makes an allegation and someone makes a counter-allegation, there is at least some interest in, um, is there a child here who could be a victim of a crime and are there other children at risk? Lord MacDonald, a former director of public prosecutions, has recently spoken about the decision of the current DPP not to prosecute the Labour peer, Greville Janner, over allegations of child sex abuse. I asked him to reflect on the past as well. The primary thing that we make of it is that we dealt with this, this sort of issue very badly in the past and now we're paying the price. Of course, the victims are paying a much bigger price than the rest of us, but we're paying the price, I think, for a carelessness about people's rights in the past, about a carelessness in terms of the way we looked after vulnerable young people in care. I think institutions from local authorities to the armed forces to the BBC have not performed as well in the past as they should have done. I hope one of the results of the inquiry will be that we'll all perform better in the future. And of course the police and prosecutors didn't perform as well in the past as they should have done. I hope people are learning lessons. And people talk about a cover-up. Do you think there was or it wasn't as organised as that? Well, I think it's just impossible to say. I think it's impossible to say, and, I, and I, I'm sure this is one of the things that uh, the major public inquiry that we're embarking upon is going to be looking at, whether there was um, a cover-up, um, whether there was anything organised about a process of concealment. I've, I've simply no idea, and at the moment no one else does either. Peter Wanless again. Of the 60,000 calls and contacts which the NSPCC helpline had last year, 1% one, 1 turned out not to be um, accurate. So, 1%? So um, people don't lightly enter into um, making um, allegations. Um, they want to be listened to, they want to be supported. Now that does need to be balanced absolutely against the rights of someone who is having um, allegations um, made against them. But we are moving I think forward to a society now and in our public services um, where we understand that it's perfectly possible for people in authority as well as people in everyday life to exercise inappropriate power over children. I've spoken to David over a couple of months now, got to know him a bit and met his wife and some of his children. He's told all of his family about his past life. It has no doubt caused pain and a few questions to be asked. So what is the upside of going public? I just hope that, if nothing else, it'll set the record straight that, you know, there were some terrible things going on. And I think the problem was that, you know, what I experienced in the mid-70s then continued. It didn't stop. You know, there were all our trials, there were all our scandals, but it just continued. And if most of them are dead, then at the very least, let's set the historical record straight. And I think, you know, politicians in all parties need to recognise that if it's an open sore, it's never going to heal. The country will never come to terms with this. Politics needs to deal with this and they need they need to recognise that some terrible things have happened. And, you know, we hear stories of cover-ups and all the rest. It all has to stop. The truth has to come out. The truth will set people free, ultimately. David isn't going to stop searching for evidence, and there are more leads to follow. Perhaps the police will find that needle in the haystack, or maybe we will. We have tried to lay out how we've gone about covering a story like David's. David, in many ways, is credible. Back at the start, I spoke to the police officer who questioned him. I detected genuine concern about him in his voice. The government's inquiry into child sex abuse will be hearing scores of stories similar to David's, and he's willing to give his evidence too. But even an exhaustive and critical inquiry with a will to dig out the truth, uncover the facts, find that elusive evidence have a huge task on their hands. Historical child sex abuse is not going away. Victims and those who witness these terrible crimes won't be ignored. They will be listened to and heard, but may not find the answers they're searching for. I've been